Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jim Martin from the Combat Studies Institute, and we're here today to talk about uh, Lesson 5 in the uh, non-resident course, the American Military Experience, 1815 to 1862. Uh, here with me today to, uh, to go through this session is uh, Dr. Chris Gable from the Combat Studies Institute and Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Shadman. What we're going to do today is deal with uh, the lesson as you're going to teach it and try to deal with some ways that we approach this particular lesson. The first area I want to deal with is the Mexican-American War and its, its role in this time period. Chris, how do you approach the Mexican-American Mexican -American War when you teach this class? Well, a good thing to bear in mind is the uh uh, lead-in that you can get from the Napoleonic Wars when you look at this conflict because that was very much the inspiration in terms of uh, commanders vision of themselves on the battlefield uh, the tactics employed and the weapons technology was essentially unchanged from the Napoleonic period Jeff? Uh, when I approach it I try and approach it from a, a point of view of the personalities involved uh, leadership, uh, what lessons you're going to learn, how you're going to try and solve problems. Uh, in the case of the United States, you're, you're strategically on the offensive against what appears to be a superior foe, you know, and how do you plan for that and how do you react to it? Yeah, I, I personally like to deal with this in pointing out what it isn't. Many of my students say, well, that was a training ground for the American Civil War. Well, while it was a leadership training ground, particularly for the junior officers, the R.E. Lees and the, and the Grants, that people who would be leaders later on, it certainly wasn't an image of what would be the American Civil War. Uh, what were the size of the formations we were dealing with in the Mexican-American War? 8,000, 9,000 for each of those armies? And we dealt with much, much larger armies when we get to the American Civil War. So while, yeah, there are some things that you can take from the Mexican-American War and move it all over into the American Civil War, you also see what the gap was between 1848 and 1861 and how possibly unprepared people could be by 1861 uh, to lead armies of 35 or 40,000 when we'd never seen that uh, in, in their military experience. All right, so I think you can approach that not only what the war was, but what the war wasn't. 
Well, it certainly uh, set up the expectations of a lot of people involved, and and uh, as you indicate, uh, not very realistically. Uh, Mexican warrior looking at a small, rather highly professional army. Uh, the technology obviously is going to change. There's a lot of things that, that a commander might expect that he knows about war in 1861 that's changed on him. What about casualties, Jeff? Do you think there's any... I mean, we, we see huge casualties by the time we hit the American Civil War. And we'll talk about how technology impacts on that. Uh, do you think maybe that that commanders expected casualties in the American Civil War at first to run like they did in the, in the Mexican-American War? They were relatively low. I, I think they expected that. Uh, but when you compare it to the Mexican-American War, I'm not sure the casualties are really that low. Uh, I think uh, on a number of troops you had involved are actually relatively high, especially when you factor in disease and the potential for non-battle casualties. So I think they're fully prepared to have relatively large casualties on a uh, per unit basis, although not the mass numbers that actually occurred. Okay, and we ask, one of the reading questions we ask students out there is, is assessing that effect of the Mexican-American War on the military institutions. And that kind of leads us towards the military between these wars. Uh, what kind of effect do you see the Mexican-American War itself having on, on the institutions which would lead us to 61, on that professional army you talked about? Well, its biggest impact was on the, the geographical uh, scope of the Army's mission. Uh, the uh, Mexican War added a tremendous amount of territory to the United States, and the United States Army did not grow to match the expansion in territory. And so in the decades between the Mexican-American War and the uh, Civil War, the United States Army on the frontier is going to be even more diluted in terms of soldiers per square mile or perhaps square miles per soldier would be more accurate uh, than it had ever been before. So you're going to go into the Civil War with an army that uh, was not used to seeing more than a company of troops assembled together in one place at one time. Yeah, for example, I mean, I'm looking at some figures I've got on the, the Army force structure over time. And it, the the uh, 1845, just before the Mexican War starts, we're running at about uh, 8,600 soldiers in the Army, roughly. Uh, 46, we go up just over 15,000. The peak of the Mexican-American War, we're at 30,000. But by 1853, we're back down to just under 14,000 that it shows here uh, as far as the authorized strengths. So like you say, the, the territory grows immensely, uh, stretches basically sea to shining sea now, but yet the army is down to a mere 14,000 soldiers uh, yes. to try to police this. I mean, you know, you keep focusing us toward uh, the American Civil War and means for there, and, and this is part of something that the United States has been learning ever since the American Revolution, and that it's a, its capacity to grow to meet any threat that it receives through volunteers that so doesn't need a large standing army. And the ability of the American army to perform well during the Mexican-American War, at least as seen by the, the public, would seem to reinforce that fact. So that until you actually need the troops, you don't need to have them on hand. Well, that brings up a question. Is, is the army that fights the Mexican-American War that prototypical volunteer army that the United States depends on, or is it a smaller professional army? The army that did most of the fighting was the professional army. There was a volunteer army that turned out, uh, but was not as uh, heavily engaged. Nonetheless, this is not a requirement in the foundation of a myth, or the perpetuation of a, of a myth. So you can leave the Civil War convinced that the uh, volunteer soldier won the war. No, it's not only that, it's like I said, what it appears to be is, you know, who are the press reporting to? They're, re they're reporting about the hometown boys and what they're doing and their success. And they're not going to be reporting on the, the regular units and the, the long-standing army. They're going to be reporting on, like, Jefferson Davis's Mississippi Rifles. Uh, and those are units that are going to get the press and the notoriety. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a, a, a small, regular professional army that uh, between 1848 and 61 is largely a constabulary force. Uh, as you said, you know, not soldiers per square mile, but square miles per soldier. Uh, how does that fit into the American strategic posture of the time? I mean, how do we, uh, do we depend largely on our Navy then? I mean, is that, 
that's what Glenn says in his, uh, Dr. Robertson in his intro, is that there's a large dependence on the Navy. It gives you the buffer, all right, so that professional army can do its thing and then grow if it needs to. Do we really spend the money to create this Navy that our st strategy calls for? Uh, yeah, to the extent that our strategy was a commerce-based one and the, the military requirements to promote commerce around the world uh, require showing the flag, maintaining a certain amount of uh, safe harbors and later calling stations. And the Navy was adequate for that largely symbolic purpose. But the Army then as now was basically uh, trying to find a mission for itself in that it had the frontier and it had coastal defense and beyond that there was not a great deal of pretense that we even needed an army. You have to kind of take a look just like we do now, try and identify just what we perceive the threat that we need military forces for. And you start taking a look at you know, 1846, 1848, and then after the Mexican-American War, you know, what is that primary threat? And I think it's still perceived to be the, the British Navy. And, and just like Chris said, you know, it's coastal defense is what's important. We have a, we're perceived as having a long enough coast, especially with the acquisition of new territory, that the British can't blockade it. So all you need is enough defense to keep to have to keep from having your port seized by the British. And uh, you do not do not need a large army to do that. What you need is fortifications, uh, and you need to protect the key points of that sea coast, like the opening into the Chesapeake Bay, so that ships can get out and spread your commerce to the world. And as long as your commerce can still get out and not be stopped, you know, you're not blockaded. Okay, so what, what we have with the, the military between the wars in this uh, period, if I've, if I've got what you guys are talking about correctly, is we have a, a small regular army, 14,000, 15,000, somewhere in there, which does the constabulary work that's got to be done. Uh, we have a, a standing navy to give us that commerce protection you talk about, to guard the approaches to the Chesapeake, along with coastal defense uh, batteries. In fact, I think the Navy is still basically a commerce rating Navy, a little bit larger, but it's to place the pressure on the British and force them to consolidate their fleet. Isn't that the, its primary purpose between the wars? Yeah, yeah, if it. there was a war. Yeah, if there would be a war. Day in, day yes. out, its presence is, is a symbolic. But our fleet is not meant for fleet action. No. Okay, we're not looking for the, the, the blue water fight then. I mean, that's not really what we're looking for here. Uh, it's largely defensive in nature, dealing with our coastal waters. And then the backbone, I guess, of the ground force would have to be considered the militia structure uh, that, that is behind that regular army. Is that accurate? Well, uh Certainly in case of any significant threat to the nation it would be, but the militia as such has become a pretty uh, ghostly presence that it doesn't have much in the way of a real physical uh, body behind it for most of the period that we're looking at here. So it's not like our National Guard today where we have an organized entity out there. By and large, you had organized units that did turn out and drill, but uh, they were as much uh, ceremonial and uh, social as anything, and there was really not that much in the way of a true implementation of the militia laws, which were still on the book. As I recall, there was only one state that actually maintained up-to-date militia roles, and I think it was Delaware. So there was not much of a physical embodiment of the militia, although certainly people still expected it to be the main line of defense in case of a war. So then, obviously, if, if they don't even have accurate roles and those sort of tools that we use today, uh, I'm sure the weapons that were out there in militia units were certainly not up to date and the, the newer technology that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. So I guess we're talking what, maybe still old flintlocks in some of them? Not even, uh, not even cap firing weapons? Maybe it's worth remembering that until our own times, that is the last century and a half, military technology didn't tend to go obsolete very fast that it was very common to finish a war, stockpile the weapons in an arsenal, and leave them there to the next war, and they were still perfectly good. And so when we look at people dealing with technological change, to us it looks like an easy thing to, uh, to deal with mentally, but to them it was a rather startling phenomenon to have weapons that were only 10 or 20 years old being obsolete.
Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure and believe that. And you know, you you did ask Chris about what he thought about the backbone of the military. And well, the militia units themselves, I agree, were not as a pool of manpower when you did need to ask for uh, volunteers. They were a great place to start at. They had already that camaraderie built and the esprit among their their unit members to get large numbers to be able to volunteer at one time rather than trying to rely on straight volunteers out of the general population. So I do think as far as a reliance, there was a reliance on the militia from that standpoint. Well, and I think that's, I think you're obviously right based on the way we see the structure uh, with a mere 15,000 sitting there in the regular army. Now, obviously someone had to be planning to use the militia as, as a backdrop there when they went through their, their assessments. Uh, they, they had to do very similar to us today to look at requirements and then try to plan against it. Now whether they, whether we agree with the requirements that they laid out, uh, I certainly don't think anyone could look forward to the requirements of the American Civil War and plan against those because that is certainly not the threat that they were they were planning against. No, and there certainly weren't major mobilization plans either to, to bring certain numbers together under certain conditions. So how ready do we think the, the forces were for the war that would come in 61? I mean, how would you assess the readiness of the regular army, the militia, for what would, what would come in 1861? Well, uh, certainly in terms of the regular army, it was in no sense postured to, uh, to fight a major war uh, with its uh, small garrison scattered all over the, the frontier and the seacoast. Uh, probably its greatest weakness was in the, uh, the fact that at the time of the Civil War there were only a handful of serving officers who had ever commanded a unit larger than a regiment in the field. Uh, and uh, what we're going to see is that uh, whereas the smaller units could be gotten ready fairly quickly uh, when it came to the generalship at the higher levels, particularly dealing with some of the changes in warfare that had transpired since 1848, the weakness will be at the, uh, at the higher operational and strategic levels. Jeff, what about you? How, do you? how would you assess the readiness of the forces? I, I would look at it a little bit differently in, in comparing the two forces as you start approaching the American Civil War. It's not so much are they prepared for it as much as both of them are prepared equally the same. So you have a balance. So if both sides had predicted and could expect what would happen and had trained larger units, you still would have had basically the same situation you had in 1861. Two forces that would not be able to come to a decisive victory early. Uh, to me, the real question becomes if one side was able to be more prepared than the other side, then what might have been different? And those are some of the issues we're trying to wrestle with today, trying to make sure that we're more prepared than an opponent, than an opponent we may meet on the battlefield. Okay. Earlier, Chris talked about changes in technology and weapon systems. And one of the things that we deal with as you lead into the American Civil War is some changes in technology that will make some changes in this war. Uh, how would you analyze those changes? I mean, what, what would you see as the most important technological changes as we move towards the American Civil War? Uh, my personal opinion is it's kind of, I think the most important change in technology would be the telegraph. I know there's a, a lot of, a lot of people try to, to think in terms of either rifling, especially in the musket, in addition to artillery, and in the railroad. Uh, but I tend to think the telegraph is more important, the ability to communicate, the ability to uh, bring different forces to bear from very different parts of the country at one concerted action, maybe not on one point but bringing pressure to bear all at one time. And by the time we get to 1864, we'll still see grants start to do that. Up to that time, your problem is, is you have to combine forces on one battlefield for them to get full effect. With the telegraph, we're able to move beyond that. And that is something that change to communications and ability to command and control with communications is still something we're progressing through today. And I think very often it gets very uh, short notice within our current army to improve versus other systems like like tanks and artillery pieces, where I think if we focus a lot more on communications, we have more effect. So when you teach this lesson, you I, I take it then you focus on the on that command and control aspect when you talk about the technological yes. change. 
uh, over some of the others. Chris, I mean, do you do likewise, or do you have a different spin? That you no, I think that I think the big one is logistics. Uh, beyond a doubt, steam power changed the face of warfare. It's important to talk long distances, but uh, steam power enabled armies to move long distances and accomplish some of the things that Jeff talked about. And it's really a quantum change uh, to go from an army wagon that can carry one ton to a steamboat that can carry 500 or a railroad train that can carry one or 200 tons. Uh, this is the first uh, major war in human history in which the movement and the logistics is not all done by muscle power. And when you think about all the changes in warfare through history up until this time, uh, as great as Napoleon was, he was still using the same logistical system as Alexander the Great which is muscle power. And this is the first great war, at least involving the United States, in which that uh, that changes, and it changes very dramatically. The, the, the key thing, the reason why I've always focused away from that is at the same time, on a, you know, on a tactical level, that's true, and on an operational level, that's very true, but on a strategic level, that also constrains yourself to only certain avenues that you can use. In the case of, of using shipping where you can carry large tonnage, or even railroads, you're tied to either railroads or you're tied to rivers. Wagons may only carry one to two tons at a time, but over multiple routes in many different places, much more difficult to predict their, their advance. And I think we've seen the same thing today with our reliance still on trucks, even though barges will still carry more than a truck wheel, uh, and even over aircraft, which are limited in where they can land, even though they can carry more tonnage than, than our trucks can. So I agree it's very important, and it's a major breakthrough in the ability to logistically, logistically supply very large armies but there's also a, a handicap to using those capabilities that I think, think sometimes is often overlooked. Well, that's true, but there are some aspects of this war that simply could not have been done uh, with wagon yes. power. Uh, you can find a number of campaigns that uh, would have ended had it not been for steam power, transportation, and logistics. I absolutely agree. The scale of this war is enormous. The distance from one theater to another would take you from Paris to Berlin and back again. And there are just some things that could not be done. Uh, campaigns, just compare this war, for example, to the French and Indian War, the American Revolution, War of 1812 on the frontier, and see how in those conflicts, 90% of the war was just getting armies where they had to be in a condition slightly better than starving to death. And the side that did that won the campaign. And suddenly in this war, we're operating over even larger distances uh, with huge armies that are uh, able to deliver enormous combat power despite the distances they've traveled. I, and as, a, as an instructor who teaches logistics and as a logistician, you begin to see here something that will be true throughout history from, from then on is that the real weakness of a logistics system, as far as the transportation goes, uh, are those joints between types of transportation. And you talk about, you know, we use the barge and it carries, what did you say, 500 tons? Is that basically it? Mm -hmm. Where a wagon carries one ton. But the barge won't have to eat any of his one ton. Well, I agree, but the, the point that slows logistics down, you'll find in this war, is when you have to take it from the barge to the wagon. And that's where life slows down. And we'll see that as, as we go right on through the wars that will follow, right through World War uh, II and all the way into Desert Storm. You see that as, as a problem. The, probably the best example would be uh, von Moltke and the Franco-Prussian War, when he gets to the frontier. And all of a sudden it's a different gauge and he's got to start unloading. And he just doesn't have the wagons to keep up with what the train will haul. So you create a whole new set of logistical problems also for the logistician with that that mass amount of, uh, of equipment that we can haul on those trains. Well, that gets back to a point Jeff raised earlier and the constraints that are involved. You draw big arrows on the map for the Civil War campaigns and the great majority of them follow rail lines or rivers or both. And the ones that don't turn into raids that they can't go where they want to go and stay where they want to stay. Because eventually example. they have to get where the other side has railroads and has yeah. rivers, so they're going to come up against the numbers that they just can't support without using the same kind of means. Best example I can think of, of that is actually outside this lesson, but it's uh, it's Sherman campaign to Atlanta 
where he basically uses the railroad bed as his axis of advance. And the, I mean, the, the supplies are going right into the back of his army as they come down from Louisville and Nashville. So it's, I think that's a good example of what you're talking about. It's, it's interesting when we talked about this, and most people, I think, would make a jump out of asking the same question about what changes in technology and would have jumped on a rifled musket. And yet, our discussion, we've completely gone away from that as if none of us have considered that as being that as important as telegraph or logistics. Well, I, I think that it makes changes at the tactical level. Where what, what you guys have talked about is largely, that there are some tactical changes, but there's a large uh, piece there that's operational and strategic. But the, that rifle musket makes changes. Earlier, you and I were talking about, uh, I asked you the max effective range of 12-pound uh, Napoleon with canister, which was a common way to utilize that weapon system in the time prior to 1861. And, and what was it? About 400. 400 yards. And what's the? What do we have as the max effective range now for this for the rifle musket? Uh, 450, 480, somewhere in there. Thousand. Thousand maybe. So we begin to see the difference here, where you know when we hit first bull run in a few minutes, and we're on Henry House Hill, and they crank up the, a battery out in front of the uh, of the Union forces as they would in the normal tactical flow uh, to start firing canister into the Confederate forces, what happens to those two batteries? And the people who man them cease to exist because of the, the ability of a rifled musket to take them out, which I, couldn't have happened earlier. I think that's a good way to approach it. The easy way to think of the, uh, the rifled musket is that it's uh, suddenly mowing down soldiers in, in huge numbers and uh, uh, rendering certain tactics impossible just because of the carnage involved. But uh, I think it's important to remember that most of Frederick the Great's frontal attacks failed. Uh, this is an incremental change, and what it's going to do is subtly alter the, the balance among the combat arms. Artillery can no longer stand in front of the infantry range and deliver canister with impunity. It's going to deepen the killing zone that a cavalry charge has to go through by a factor of four. And so it's not going to irrevocably change the face of the battlefield, but what it does is it subtly changes the balance of what works and what doesn't. It changes the percentages. It changes the batting average, so to speak, of a specific <coughs> tactic in a specific situation. And I think that's where this particular technological change comes in. But even with the improvements in rifling, you still had to fire, on the average, 150 rounds to wound one enemy soldier in this war. And so it's not as if everybody's dying from musket shots all of a sudden. Well, and I think the fact is, if, if my reading's correct, is that the average infantry soldier in one of these battles didn't fire 50, 60, 70 rounds. I mean, if they got off eight or nine or 10 rounds, that, that would fall more into the uh, to the realm of reality. Uh, looking at it from a logistician, I mean, we're still 50 or 60 years from a point in time where an infantry soldier can't carry enough with him, basic load of, of bullets, to keep him through a very extended period of time. Nothing like what we have today, where you know machine guns run out of ammo and you've got to have ammo bearers to continue to get it for them. That's not the the kind of volume we're dealing with here. We're dealing with maybe 40, 50, 60,000 men, each firing eight or 10 rounds, rather than hundreds of rounds per man. So it, there's, a, there's a, as you say, it's an incremental change. What about later in the war, we'll go to breech loaders, not in the same kind of quantity as the muzzle loaders early, but uh, do you th see that making much of a difference? No. So all the hoopla about repeating rifles. The, the problem perceived then with repeating rifles, with first of all, you're talking two different things now between repeaters and breech loaders, which are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, but in the case of, of both those weapons, you're talking a, a much more sophisticated piece of ammunition that has to be manufactured in, in great numbers. And if you tried to outfit a whole army with those types of weapons, uh, the logistics system just couldn't keep up with that type of manufacture and distribution. Uh, as perceived by the people making decisions on whether to use those kinds of weapons or not. 
Uh, the fact is, if someone's firing a repeater, it's you can anticipate a soldier will fire more often, probably less carefully, uh, and you use up their ammunition very quickly and need to be resupp resupplied very quickly. Now, we would look back today and say, yeah, but you can do the same thing with one-tenth of soldiers. So, you know, maybe it'll balance out in the long run. Well, but then again, if it's a balance, have you gained anything? Yeah, I think they perceived then, we can look back in hindsight and say they made a mistake not going into those new technologies. But in reality, to bankroll the new technologies to the expense of other things without being sure they would work without those problems, uh, I think probably would have been a mistake. And I think from a soldier's perspective, the one thing about the, the repeater or the, or the breech loading weapon is that you no longer had to be standing to reload that weapon system. It's much harder with a muzzle loader to do that in, in a prone position, where from a soldier's survival standpoint at least, uh, you could now take those weapons and fire them and reload them from the prone. At the same time, you got a soldier in a prone position and you're, you're fighting out of cornfields and wheat and you can't see your target. So it's all fine and good to say that. What you can really do is protect a soldier before the infantry is close enough to shoot at them. But for the most part, they're still going to have to stand to shoot at an approaching battle line. Well, probably the biggest impact of those weapons isn't with infantry at all. But one of the things that emerges at Bull Run is that traditional sword-wielding cavalry seems to be losing a decisive place on the battlefield. And uh, the repeating weapons, the breech loaders in particular, are going to, I think, play their greatest role later in the war when it comes to the cavalry arm. But that's not a factor in, in the Bull Run battle. So basically we begin to see what will later be called mountain infantry, where they can use their horses as, as a, a means to carry them somewhere and then dismount and fight as infantry. That as it might be to load a muzzle loader on the ground, doing it on a horseback is, is yes. a That's major a good point. problem. You know, a lot of times we approach the American Civil War like, like it's a continuation of the Napoleonic tactics. In the case of cavalry, that would mean a shock arm. By the time you see the, the both armies in the, the beginning of the American Civil War, the cavalry is primarily a reconnaissance arm. Uh, a raiding arm, and they're not really used as a shock arm at all. So you see the, the cavalry units distributed throughout an army, uh, sometimes as low as brigade level, to be used in reconnaissance and not formed together uh, as large units to be used. And uh, so that's a, that's a good point. It kind of breaks from the traditional thought process, too, that they're based on Napoleonics. I think you can see from our discussion here that, that on the, the idea of technology, there's different ways you can go. Uh, but I think the three key elements that you probably want to deal with is, the, uh, uh, is communications, command and control, like Jeff talked about, is uh, logistics, which largely here the technological change is in the, uh, the steam engine, the rail, uh, the, uh, the boat, uh, that area, and then in the weapon systems, the, uh, the muzzle, uh, the uh, rifle muzzle loader specifically. And I don't know if everyone out there really knows what the difference is in that between the between the smoothbore weapon and the and the rifled musket. I mean, the, the basic difference is with a and correct me if I get off here, but with a smoothbore weapon, because of the way that black powder fouls uh, a bore, you end up using a a ball that is much smaller, somewhat smaller than the bore itself is because otherwise, as it fouled, you'd, ha you'd have a hard time getting it down in there after repeated rounds. So really, this thing is being fired. There are no grooves in that barrel. It's smooth bore. So it's bouncing down the muzzle as it comes down, or down the bore. And basically, wherever it bounces last is what's going to determine where it's going to go, whether it's going to be a little high, a little low, a little left, a little right. Where with the invention of the Minet ball, which will expand to fit those grooves, and it lands and grooves in the rifle musket, you now have some ballistic stability when that round comes out the, comes out the barrel. Much like, I mean, what we're more used to today. And, and that gives you that greater range with accuracy than you've got before. Also has to be a little smaller, smaller because you're still dealing with black powder, so it'll still foul the bore. But now it, the back of it will expand with those gases, grab the lands and grooves, and down it'll go. So that's really the, is that an accurate uh, uh, discussion of the basics between those two? Yeah, the rifle was recognized for its advantages and accuracy for, oh, probably 200 years, but finding a practical military weapon, particularly with the loading problem you've identified, was really what prevented its being widely adopted, I would imagine.
Yeah, and I think too, keep in mind that there are advantages to the musket. Uh, one, it could be loaded more quickly because it didn't fit as tightly, so you could fire it more quickly than you could a rifle. In addition, when you got into close range, uh, you could double shot it, which you couldn't do with a rifle. So while you may not have the accuracy you do with a ball, you can put two balls down the bore at one time. Uh, so if you could find positions where you didn't have to worry about the range of the rifle musket, say 100 yards in front of a tree line, uh, a musket can be very effective and very often more effective than a rifle. Okay. Jeff, what about, we haven't talked about artillery much at all, but what about the state of, I mean, you're an artilleryman, what about the state of artillery going into the American Civil War? Well, artillery, of course, ruled supreme on the battlefield throughout history. The, uh, the more appropriately, it, uh, that's a good question. Artillery, you know, especially with the changes to a, with the rifle musket, and we've, we talked about that a little bit, really uh, during the Mexican-American War you saw artillery having a great effect uh, offensively for the American Army. By the time you get to the American Civil War, for the reasons that Chris mentioned earlier about the inability to unlimber within rifle range of enemy troops, which is about the same max effective range as canister, you cannot get the same offensive use out of your artillery. Another factor that works into it is tree lines and close quarters, and that you had to get too close to be able to unlimber, and you, even muskets could then get you. It wasn't just a rifle. But if you could set up in a position defensively with artillery, spread among your between the regiments of a brigade, uh, artillery was very devastating on the defense, and I think just strengthened the defense tremendously in doing that. Uh, very rarely did you see the kind of artillery counter battery fire that you see at Gettysburg before Pickett's charge. Uh, most of the time it's an anti-infantry weapon used by the defense and that's where it has its greatest impact. And we've talked about canister here. Uh, you know, folks, uh, the instructors out there may not understand exactly what it is. Now, either of you want to explain to me what canister really was? All right, Chris, go with that. Uh, for a 12-pounder Napoleon, a uh, canister would be 27 iron balls, about an inch and a half, packed in a can with a powder charge behind it. And when the powder charge detonated, the can and the balls would spray out shotgun fashion. Short maximum range, but uh, terribly effective against massed infantry. So, so we're talking about one pound each ball? No, it's not a pound. Well, I mean, just about, remember what the weight is? No, I, I really don't. But we're basically turning that 12-pound Napoleon then into a shotgun. Yes. I mean, that's really what we're doing with it. Okay. Uh, that gives you an idea about infantry weapons, uh, artillery, as, as we start into this war. What I'd like to do is leave technology here for a minute. And, and Chris, you and I talked earlier today about the importance of war aims. How do you approach the war aims as we roll towards the American Civil War in 1861 uh, when you teach this class? Well, I think that war aims in this conflict, as in any war that you may study in this course, are a very, very valuable uh, uh, ruler to hold up against the operations that you'll be looking at as you go through the war. If you establish up front what the war aims are, that gives you then a gauge against which you can judge the strategies and the campaigns that the various players will uh, will choose to implement as the war goes along, give you some ability to assess whether they were doing the right thing or not. In the case of the American Civil War, uh, you need to be rigorous in your definitions, war aims being the political end state that the nation wishes to achieve uh, by resorting to arms. And that needs to be kept distinct from strategy, which is the various employment of military means to accomplish those aims. In the American Civil War, uh, you need to get to the point where there's some consensus that the war aims are essentially uh, on the part of the Confederacy to establish and maintain its status as a sovereign independent state and for the uh, Union uh, to restore the Union or as the war aims were stated uh, to preserve the Union in that the uh, Lincoln administration refused to admit that secession had ever taken place. So if you take these two war aims, you can then go through the remainder of this conflict, and every time you come to a campaign, uh, an operational concept, uh, you can hold that up against this war aim and ask your students whether this particular campaign plan will take you to, towards your war aim or not.
uh, and this gives you something beyond uh, just uh, romance and mythology in judging uh, what was effective and what was not in terms of the campaigns and battles of this war. Um, uh, one illustration of this for down the road is that the, the focus on perhaps something like the Battle of Gettysburg will be inevitable and yet when you hold this up to the war aims and ask what did this campaign accomplish in terms of either side's war aim, uh, the answer is not much because things didn't change after that. So I think it's a fine instrument to use in assessing what the different campaigns of this war were truly all about. And I agree with, with Chris completely, and you start to take a look at 1861 and 1862 and what the war aims are, uh, that definitely has an impact on the military campaigns. They're, they're waged for limited objectives, they're attempting to use limited power, and both sides are attempting not to punish the other side uh, by destroying cities, by destroying towns, by by ticking off the civilian population, uh, and both sides are doing those things. And we'll see a change by the time we get to the end of the war. So a lot of times you see the criticism of the generalship early in the war and the campaigns that are developed. It's based on the war aims in 1865, not the war aims in 1861. So you have to be very careful to identify it. And sometimes those aims are not always easy to identify. You have to kind of extrapolate it from a lot of different pieces of information to determine what they were at the time. The war aims aren't always what the president says they Correct. are. Correct. And as you allude to, uh, very typically in a war, the, the aims will modify and change over time, uh, whether anybody wants them to or not. Uh, the, the conduct of war itself can introduce new goals into what the nation needs to accomplish by the end of that war. Well, I think one of the most controversial discussions about war aims here, I get it from my students every time I teach this course, wraps around uh, slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation. Was it really a war aim of the Union to end slavery? I mean, that, though this is military history, that pops up every time I teach it. And I, I go back to a, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this quote from, from Lincoln. It's, uh, he said that if I could, uh, if I could preserve the Union and, and never free a slave, I would. And if I could preserve the Union and free all the slaves, I would do so. And if I could preserve the Union and free some of the slaves and not free others, I would do so. My goal is to preserve the Union. And that's a paraphrase, but I think that goes back to the heart of the war aim you talked about earlier. That's the key. And even when he does do the Emancipation Proclamation, I mean, that's a diplomatic and political statement driving towards that preservation. It, it's not a human rights issue. It's really driving towards preservation. At the same okay. time, it, you can't get away from that. Slavery is probably the one primary divisive issue between the two sections. And while you don't have uh, the North going to war for the sake of abolition, uh, per se, you, you still can't get away from the fact that the primary divisive issue between the two sections is still slavery. And I, I think you'll find when you guys teach this class that uh, though, though this is military history, evolution of modern warfare, you'll, this may be the first class you get where there are a lot of your students who have some very definite opinions. I mean, most people don't have a lot of opinions about the Mexican-American War. But when you hit the American Civil War, you run into Civil War buffs, you run into people who have read more on this than any other conflict you've hit so far, and they have some very pronounced opinions. I think you, you won't have any problem when you get into this war getting class participation on some of these discussions. Uh, as you hit First Bull Run and, and you hit the technology piece here and then move on in the next lessons that deal with the American Civil War. And really from here on out, I find in my classes that I get more and more participation as we leave the American Civil War because people study this war and then you move towards the 20th century where people are much more familiar with, yeah. really fact, with what's going your on. Your problem does change though in that you have a few people that will know a lot. Uh, sometimes though it's, it's actually pretty limited and those that still don't know any more than they did about the Mexican-American War and they apply that same level of knowledge to the American Civil War. And while you may have more participation, the participation, participation will really be key to a few individuals and the challenge becomes how do you get the other people into it? And, uh, and 
one way to try and do that is when people offer their opinion and it's an informed opinion based on their readings is even if you believe and you support their same opinion just come across with something that's different and challenge them and that that'll help encourage those others to challenge them as well even though they may not have the same background knowledge okay uh, anything else on war aims for me there but it's one of those things that's not treated a lot in Glenn's intro, but it's something that, that, that we're agreed that you need to lay a foundation here to help you as you move along in, in later lessons. Well, I do it in every, every lesson where we deal with the war, because unless you establish what the war aims are, you have no grounds upon which to evaluate strategy and campaign planning. You use it regularly as an analytical tool then. Yeah. You give them, a, give them an azimuth, and then you can check how well people do against that aspect. Indeed. Basically. And also look at how war aims change during a conflict, especially the longer it goes. So, yeah. Just before we go on to the case study of uh, a First Bull Run and talk about it and the article that Glenn's got out there, uh, I have something that I normally do with my students that I call the balance sheet and try to lay out for these two forces, you know, what their relative strengths and weaknesses were. Uh, and, and there's a lot of ways to do it. I probably go into more detail than I should, but what you might want to do is lay out some of the differences, such as population difference between the two sides. Uh, a rather mundane topic, but it allows you, uh, if you only have a very small population, you can only mobilize a certain portion of that population, because you still have to feed people. Someone still has to farm. And depending on which source you deal with, uh, I've seen in a lot of different numbers, uh, I use I use these, and uh, the North had roughly 22 million population of 22 million at the at the coming of the war, where the South was running somewhere just under 10 of usable manpower, and I think that lays out. Well, that's total population, white and black, right? Slave and free combined. So it lays out some of the initial problems that the South's got in trying to match the North in this particular war. You talk about how they're equally. They have equal problems earlier, but uh, the, the big advantage for the North is that they have far more to start with. It's like a basketball team that's got five and one that's got ten, and uh, you know there's some there's some issues of tiredness there and and just being able to throw a lot of numbers at people. So they start in a bit of a hole there. Uh, the Confederacy does when they start into this. Uh, some of the other things I like to talk about are uh, the miles of railroads that are available to them, you know, using that logistics piece that you talked about earlier. The sheer mileage that's out there in the north, because of its economy and the way it worked, uh, much more railroad uh, mileage was built there than there was in the south. The agriculture economy of the south didn't, didn't dwell on industry, therefore didn't have near as much rail. Uh, some of those sort of things. Uh, Square miles. Actually, the, the Confederacy in many ways is bigger uh, for for square mileage uh, than is the Union. And then I look at a couple other things. Uh, I go into horses and mules, which again, though we've got steam, uh, you've still got to take things by wagon to most armies. And the the Union will have a tremendous advantage in, in horses. Uh, I think part of that is keeping Missouri and Kentucky nominally on the Union side in the war. Those are two you know, places that you can get considerable horse flesh. But I think that sometimes it can be helpful in doing that kind of a balance sheet, uh, just a very quick balance sheet look at, at what each side starts the war with. Because it has something to do with the strategy that is translated from those military aims. Because if you only have X amount to deal with, there are some things you can do and some things you cannot do. You know, Jim, I, I always think you got to be careful, though, and you know, make sure you do balance it. And just to highlight a couple of things, for example, in population, uh, while the, the South definitely has a much smaller population than the North, uh, at the same time, they're not going to have to, if, if you look at their war aims, and they're defensive in nature, they just have to maintain their territorial integrity. As the North advances, they need to use more troops to maintain their lines of communications, so that strips away from combat power from the front. And that's just talking about mobilized manpower. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in the case of the railroads, you 
the North does have a much greater number of railroads, but do they have a greater number of railroads where it advances into the Confederacy itself? And that becomes a more important point. It's fine for moving the logistics around in the rear, but when you try and get it down into the armies, and you can only support so much manpower, it kind of inhibits the, the sheer number or number of miles of railroads becomes less important than the number of railroads that are entering the Confederacy. The same with the population. If you can only support an army of X size, it doesn't matter how many people you can mobilize for the military, you can only use an army that's big enough that's the size that you can support. And another one in the case of horses and mules, uh, the South is, is falling back toward their depots. They don't have to bring the supplies forward like the, the northern armies do. Uh, at the same time, they're using the slave population to, to farm and grow things, whereas a lot of the horses and mules are being used on farms in the north and otherwise aren't available. So while it would look, the balance sheet looks kind of uneven, and very often that's used to support uh, the southern military does so much better because look at how far down they start to begin with. There's a lot more balance in there when you take a look at it than otherwise would appear. Well, see, I think the, the mileage of railroads in the north uh, versus south is is a bigger issue than you do. These rails normally run, they don't run north into south because that wasn't the trade route. Uh, they run from the east into the old northwest, into Iowa, Ohio, that area, which allows the, the north to move considerable forces back and forth between the theaters if they wish to. Now then the, the nice thing for them is that the rivers strike deep into the south while the rail doesn't go there. Many of the rivers, when you get over into the Western Theater, uh, go from the north and flow south. Yeah. And so, you know, what I think those rails give you is the ability to move uh, equipment, manpower, supplies uh, laterally between the theaters. Well, you then do have the problem, and, and very few rail lines, uh, the LNO, Louisville, Nashville. No, I, okay. I admit Those there's a difficult. definite advantage. I just want to, you've got to take a look at it and recognize maybe the advantage isn't as great as just looking at the mileage would indicate. Yeah. I just like to use uh, this balance sheet piece to give a context. Okay, not to, it doesn't explain the war by any means. What it does is lay out a context for my students that shows you know, maybe it dictates some of why the South strategy is, is set up the way it is. You know, is, is the South strategy dictated by what they want to do or is it dictated by what they can do? Okay, so there's, there's just some arguments there that you can use. I think it places it in context. And it's just one of the techniques that I like to use. Oh, it's handy neither side has a blank slate. And one thing to bear in mind when you're looking at the advantages of the North is that many, if not most of them, do not translate into military advantages at Bull Run. The simple fact is that these are assets that that are not easy to turn into military power, particularly in the time we're looking at when governmental powers are limited by today's standards. So all those rail, rail miles may or may not be an advantage. It depends on what the Union government is able to do with them. And how they use them, yes. The last thing that we do in this lesson is, is we use First Bull Run as a, as a case study on kind of to wrap up these changes between the war and what the Army looks like. Uh, Jeff, how do you use this case study when you teach it in the classroom? Uh, in honesty? Yes. I don't. Okay, why? I, I tend to, to fall away from, from uh, Bull Run or First Manassas, depending upon how you want to call it, uh, for the simple reason that there's so many other good issues to talk about, I just don't get there. That's the primary reason. The second reason I don't focus on is we're going to focus on a lot of other campaigns where I can refer back to it and talk about how things have changed, so I don't feel a need to, to really get into it. Uh, if I've always gone in prepared to get into it, and to me the, the thing to focus on as you do is you have both sides actually come up with pretty sophisticated plans on how to use their military forces, uh, much greater than you'd expect based on them not having any experience at handling forces of that size. What they're unable to handle though is that the execution of orders are not trained or they're not drilled. People don't know how to handle them, how to handle their orders. They don't know how to to use their own initiative within small units when the plan has to change. So you'll see a breakdown on both sides during the battle. But keep in mind that the, the plan itself is pretty sophisticated from both sides and they do understand what to do with the forces. It's just in the execution there begins to be problems and they're not prepared to handle those problems. And Jeff brings up a point for all you out there that while we give you a lesson plan and, and we set you with some things to talk about, you're not going to be able to get to everything in all these lessons. 
We normally give you more than will fit in two hours, uh, to be honest with you. So you've got to pick and choose. Uh, myself, I like to use this uh, case study just to show uh, potential impact that we're going to have when, when the leaders on both sides have been trained, basically, by the same system where you have a northern leader and a southern leader who try to do basically the same thing at first bull run. And because they were trained in the same schools. Uh, you know, this the long discussion about the impact of West Point here. Uh, to me, one of the things that's always interesting is what we've got is we've got two armies whose leaders were trained the same way. And so they, they often do things very similar. And they're able to read each other pretty well. Chris, how do you use it? Uh, well, it, uh, it illustrates so many of the things that we've touched upon. You can simply pull pieces and parts out of this uh, campaign, as we've been doing as we've gone through our discussion here this afternoon, uh, to, to illustrate uh, tactics, technology, logistics, many of the things play out here, uh, including uh, one, might, uh, one might inquire as to what this does in terms of the war aims of the participants. Does this campaign make a great deal of sense. Uh, would the capture of Richmond have ended the rebellion? Would the capture of Richmond, which has only been the capital of the Confederacy for a matter of a couple months, have caused the Confederates to throw their hands up and say, oh, that's too much, we quit. And I think it begins to introduce some thoughts about how bitterly and stubbornly this conflict is going to be played out. Because we're in a theater, this is simply the first of many essentially uh, stalemates that we're going to run into in this theater. They're going to continue for three more years. And one of the other things I like to point out in this class and when I teach my Civil War class is that both sides approach this believing that this will be a one battle war. And we're looking for a decisive victory here and the other will go away basically. Uh, there's even the you know, the, the story that you got in the, in the Civil War PBS type series, the guys doing the picnics up on the hillside, because war is, is a, it's a gala to go and watch. But they, both sides' leaders will get a, a quick education into the violence and difficulty of this war uh, with the, the, the victory that the South will win, but a, uh, not a clear, decisive victory by any means and both sides being being bloodied much more than they expected to be bloodied. I think it leaves an imprint down on the leadership, uh, makes them think a little about those war aims, because all of a sudden this isn't going to be the, the easy, decisive, we'll whip them and on we'll go. Uh, I think they start to get that feeling for just how difficult this war may be uh, with, this, with this first battle, serious battle of the war. That's where they do fall into that Napoleonic concept of win the decisive battle, you win the war. And that's just not going to happen. Okay, as we close, any, any parting comments uh, from you two on, on teaching this lesson or anything we haven't touched on here? Yeah, there's two thoughts, not just for this lesson, but I think they're particularly prominent when you're looking at the Civil War. Uh, number one, the people who lived this did not have a crystal ball, and they didn't know it was going to be a four-year conflict. Had they known that, undoubtedly they would have done things differently in 1861. And number two, uh, none of them, as far as I know, ever got up and in one morning and decided to do something profoundly stupid. A lot of Civil War historiography uh, focuses on the chump of the month club and how dumb could this guy be. Uh, whereas I think there's a lot more to be learned from history in general and from the Civil War in particular if you approach it with a philosophy that the individuals involved were doing what they thought was the best thing based upon the information they had and the uh, context they found themselves in. And from my part, that goes back to something that I normally tell my students in the very first day. And that's when, when you study history, you can only hold historical actors responsible for what they could have known. I mean, the vast knowledge that we have since then of what happened and, well, they should have realized this. You can only hold them responsible for something that they could have known at the time. Uh, but like you said, they don't have a crystal ball and they can't see into the future. So you have to be careful when you evaluate them to not impose ideas on them that they could not have had. Because, But you're real smart because you're 100 years later and you have so much more to look back on. 
Anything, uh, any closing thoughts here, Jeff? But to return to where I started is, is a look at generalship. You're looking in the Mexican-American War, we have our junior officers that are fighting that war that are, have come out of West Point, and they're trained to be military professionals, but their senior commanders are not. You know, Scott, Taylor, these are guys that have come up before West Point and they're in charge. So you have a, as you take a look at the Mexican-American War, take a look at the differences between your senior leaders and your junior leaders. Then try and ask yourself, what do those junior leaders learn from the Mexican-American War and how are they going to apply those lessons in the American Civil War? And part of that is they've been successful in that Mexican-American War. So they're going to try and use those as positive lessons and stick to them. Uh, in the case of the South, you're probably going to find they're going to stick to those lessons much longer than the North will, uh, and largely because at the beginning of the war, they're still successful with those tactics, or at least they perceive it as so, whereas the North will change and adjust. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting to watch that interplay. And just to also reinforce what Chris said when he talked about stump the chump, uh, it's real easy to criticize some of the, the generals, especially early in the war. An example would be General McClellan. He's criticized very often, but he was a very effective general. He had some major flaws, uh, but some of his ideas were really good in how to prosecute the war and may have been successful. However, it also would have been led to a protracted war probably, as opposed to a very quick, short war, which is what Lincoln was after at the time. And in, in closing here, I think that uh, the one comment I'd leave you with as, as we close out is that don't feel compelled to use everything that you've read, everything you've heard in here in the conduct of your lesson. Uh, all of us walk into a classroom prepared to teach all of these things, but we, we go where the class takes us, largely. If your students get interested in something, uh, we let them talk generally. Yes. So don't feel compelled to get through all of this. It's not a check the block effort. It's, it's looking at those things which are, uh, which you can use to make your students think, because that's really what we're here for. It's not teach them what to think, but it's teach them how to think and, and use those things that, that you can really pull out of them. Thank you very much.